all over the world, people will tell us that when their heart stops beating, for example, they say that they leave their physical bodies, they view their physical bodies from a distance, they enter into a state of consciousness that no matter how articulate they may be, they say it's utterly beyond description or indescribable or ineffable. Do I believe in ghosts? No, I don't. But I've seen two of them. Based on my personal experience in my working with patients, I have no doubt that we pre-exist this physical body and we post-exist this physical body. Well, I think it's very important to recognize that there is no such thing as death. There's death of a physical body as we know it, but the soul never dies. The soul is eternal. When a person leaves the body, the soul is still quite normal and healthy and intact and will live on. This life is the countdown to eternity. I'm Kelsey Bolin, and I'll be your guide through our investigation into the fascinating world of ghosts and the afterlife. What you believe to be true may actually change after watching this program, as it discusses not only the possibility of whether or not ghosts exist, but the scientific evidence that has been found to substantiate their existence. Throughout this program, we will consult with the top experts in the field of life after death and how the human soul can continue on after leaving the physical body. These experts will include Dr. Raymond Moody, MD, Dr. Jeffrey Rediger, MD, Dr. Vernon Sylvest, MD, Dr. Kenneth Rose, PhD, Dr. Norm Sheely, MD, PhD, and Captain Frederick Skip Atwater, the operations officer in charge of the top secret military operation, Stargate. Uh, all over the world, people will tell us that when their heart stops beating, for example, they say that they leave their physical bodies, they view their physical bodies from a distance, they enter into a state of consciousness that no matter how articulate they may be, they say it's utterly beyond description or indescribable or ineffable. But the way they describe it is to say that they go through a passageway into a realm of light in which they see relatives of theirs who have already died and passed away seem to be there to meet them. And they talk about panoramic memory of seeing everything they've ever done displayed around them in a kind of holographic vision. Well, I think it's very important to recognize that there is no such thing as death. There's death of a physical body as we know it, but the soul never dies. The soul is eternal. And when a person leaves the body, the soul is still quite normal and healthy and intact and will live on. Do I believe in ghosts? No, I don't. But I've seen two of them. 
my experience with seeing a real ghost was in Woodstock, New York, and I used to buy a lot of furniture from this guy named Bob, and he had a partner named Phil, and it was called Phil Bob's Antiques. And I would go in, and I had all kinds of really uh, dainty, I used to love to buy, you know, cups and saucers and dainty things, and they would come over for a tea some afternoons, and everybody would, you know, laugh at me for all that. And so I had a new girlfriend, and I went up to Woodstock, and we go into my little house with the, <laughs> the doilies and all, and she asked me if my aunt had decorated, I, re I remember that. I said, no, this guy Bob at Philip Bob's decorated it. And I said, let's go on over and let's, let's see him because there's, there's uh, you know, a bunch of stuff there I want to look at. So we go into town and his partner is weeping in the office. The landlord had come in, doubled their rent, and Bob dropped dead the day before. Tried to get over it, went out to dinner, life went on, and we walked back to my house about a mile from the center of town. And there's a, a light on the um, driveway, and there's like a big cord of uh, cut wood, firewood there. And when we turn the corner, the light is on the firewood, and Bob, is sitting on the firewood with a green down vest and brown cords, and he's just kind of sitting and, and I mean, I, I see it as clear as I saw it that night, and just looking down. Well, I gasp. She yells. I grab her, and we run into the house, and I slam the door, and almost like in a movie, you know, like, up against the door like, you know, what, Bob's gonna suddenly rise up like a monster and come after me. And I said, I am so sorry, but I, I thought I saw, she said, you mean the guy in the green vest on the wood pile? She said, I saw him too, that's why I yelled. I said, you're kidding. She goes, no, I saw him. It was a little dark haired guy with the, uh, the green vest and brown cords. I said, yeah, that was Bob. I saw him too, but you don't know him. And she says, no, I, I don't know who, I don't know. I didn't know who it was. She thought it was a real person, like, you know, a trespasser or something. That's how real this guy was. It wasn't like, you know, a hologram. What this life is, is a countdown to eternity. Plato's Allegory of the Cave describes people who live chained in a cave, facing a blank wall for their entire lives. These people can only see the shadows of reality projected on the blank wall by the light of a fire that burns behind them. Over time, these people begin to assign definitions as to what they think these shadows represent, what they believe these shadows to be. Plato believed that these shadows are as close to what most people come to see as reality, a very poor reflection of what reality actually is. In this allegory, Plato describes the philosopher as being like a prisoner who has escaped from the cave and who comes to understand that the shadows on the wall are not representative of reality at all. And that is what this program is all about. What reality is when we move on from this earthly plane of existence and what the physical laws are that explain this reality. I was trained as a medical doctor to believe that the firing and functioning of neurons in the brain, brain cells, gives rise to a neural network that then gives rise to consciousness in a thinking brain. These ideas can't be the whole story. They may be true, but only true to a point. If consciousness exists between people and can even affect physical changes, then consciousness is not quite limited in some way to the firing of neurons in a working or thinking brain. 
You know, when we think of ghost, we often think of something that's frightening and so on. But ghost is really synonymous with spirit. And we happen to have lived in an old, old home that was built in the early 1800s. And the original basement was the original kitchen. And when I would walk through there as a child, uh, they would send me downstairs to the canning cellar uh, to get a jar of string beans or whatever and to send up on the dumbwaiter. And so as I walked through there, I could feel the presence. Couldn't see or hear anything, but I could feel them. And today we know that's called clairsentience, the sensing of an entity or a ghost, if you will. I could feel their presence following me as I went to the dumbwaiter. I shoved the old dumbwaiter upstairs as fast as I could go and then made for the staircase. And when I made for the staircase, I could feel these spirits following me. And when I went up the steps, I could feel them almost lunge at me. Now, years later, the great spiritual healer, Olga Worrell, was visiting our home. And when she looked at me and she said, Reed, do you ever feel the presence of someone? I said, oh, Tanta Olga, indeed I do. <laughs> she said, well, they're not evil. They're just not progressed and they're still there. Now you need to just stop when you feel them coming up and starting to lunge. You need to turn around and say, this is our home now, the words of the great Olga Worrell. This is our home. And you need to go into progression. Why are you still here? Today, our family still owns that property, and there's nothing there. They evidently have gone on into the light. Ghost caught on tape. The Savannah Cemetery Ghost. The city of Savannah, Georgia has a somewhat torrid past. Most of the homes in the city have been built over Native American and colonial burial grounds. The ravages of the Civil War were felt in the many bloody battles fought in this city. Also, there have been a number of devastating and massive fires, unexplained deaths, and the Great Yellow Fever epidemic of 1820. With this troubled history, Savannah is often regarded as one of the most haunted cities in the United States. On December 31st of 2008, Teenager Jesse Greathouse was on vacation with the rest of his family to take in the sights of Savannah. Visiting the historic Colonial Park Cemetery, which was constructed in 1750 and is now home to more than 9,000 graves, Jesse began taping the cemetery grounds and soon sees what appears to be a small boy in the form of a bright luminescent image running across the cemetery grounds. As the boy proceeds through the cemetery, he suddenly disappears behind a gravestone, then appears to jump up into a neighboring tree, and then jump back down and disappear. Jesse's videotape has been carefully examined by video effects artists and expert videographers, all of whom found the video to be 100% authentic and unaltered. A young girl repeatedly complained to her father that something kept bothering her as she tried to play. When her father asked her exactly what it was that was upsetting her, she was unable to give him a clear explanation of what she was experiencing. A week went by with the little girl being unable to explain her fears, but regardless, she kept complaining that there was something happening that frightened her. Concerned that there was something inappropriate going on, her father set up cameras all over the house to see what might be the cause of his daughter's fears. After letting the cameras run for a few days, the father reviews the tapes, and what he finds is really frightening.
I believe that spirit is always spirit. And when they visit through us or manifest through us, they are actually there manifesting. However, when that manifestation is finished and completed, then they return to their spiritual home, whatever gradation and plane that may be on. Throughout the millennia, we've believed that life continues after life. We've believed that there are men that can see images from a great distance and foretell what events may happen in the future, and men who can communicate with those who have physically died. The Bible is replete with these stories of prophecies, communicating with people who have passed on to another life, and stories of people with the ability to return from the dead. In fact, every society and every major religion throughout time has believed in life after life. Rational inquiry into near-death experiences started with the advent of rational inquiry itself. Ancient Greek philosophers were familiar with the phenomenon of what occurs after a person dies and comes back to tell the story, and they were fascinated by it. Plato, in his masterwork, The Republic, describes an Armenian warrior who was pronounced dead after being slain on the battlefield. However, at his funeral, much to his friend's surprise, he returned to life and described an experience much the same as the stories we will hear today. Next, we will speak to Michaela Roser, who will recount her experiences when she experienced clinical death after an automobile accident a few years ago. In July of 1994, my family was on the way home from a vacation at Ocean City, Maryland. My mom was driving and my dad was in the passenger seat. Um, my brother and I were in the back with two of our friends and uh, we were going up a hill following a truck carrying farm equipment. And it was going really slow, so my mom had the four-way flashers on. We were going maybe 20 miles an hour and a 16-year-old girl who had her license for a couple weeks tried to pass us in a no-passing zone and when she went to pass there were cars coming in the opposite direction she tried to avoid the accident and crashed into the trunk of our car going about 80 miles an hour uh, our car was then pushed underneath the truck in front of us because it didn't have a bumper and we were drugged for about a football field in length uh, the luggage that was in the trunk of the car was pushed under the seat and it pushed the seat up, the roof came down, my arms went through the rear windshield and my head hit the roof of the car. A doctor came to the site to help stabilize me and then I was life flighted to Kahnemaw Memorial Hospital. En route to the hospital, I was losing a lot of blood and I flatlined. Uh, from that point, I remember being embraced by this peaceful, bright light, and I was part of the light, I became one with it, and I kind of was sucked through like a vacuum down to earth, and I ended up looking at my body lying on a hospital bed from up in the corner of the hospital room. I could go in and out of body at that point. I would go into my body because I had this burning desire to be with my body to kind of try to reconnect. But when I was inside, it would get too painful at times and I just couldn't take it so I would pop back out. And I could control when I wanted to go in and out of my body at that, at that time. And I, I noticed that when I was out of body, there was this serene silence, just like a peaceful silence. It was almost like music, it was so sweet. In the following sequence, ghost hunter Yoshi Nurajumi attempts to track down the ghost of a high school track star who was murdered and dismembered in a mountain valley above Malibu, California over 20 years ago. You are. You are. So you can tell us your name. You're real with us, please. Don't be alarmed and don't be scared. We're here to help. We want to know what happened. You like the wood.
Now, if you had a chance to say anything to your parents, what would you say right now? What would you say to them? The hunt was going pretty uneventfully until later in the evening when we were walking toward where the victim's head was found and Max suddenly refuses to go any further. Then, a few seconds later, a ghostly image runs across the field behind Yoshi and Max. Did you see that? I missed it. It was like a light, like a... Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's like going that way. All right. This is a slow motion replay of the image. Keep your eyes peeled on the very top right of the screen, and you'll see the ghostly image run swiftly across the screen from screen right to screen left. The image is transparent to the point where you can literally see through the image and see the bushes and trees behind him. Today, we're visiting one of the most haunted cities in Los Angeles, California, Calabasas. It is not only haunted by a number of celebrities, but many ghost sightings have been reported here as well. This is the famous hanging tree located in downtown Calabasas, California. So what happened here? Hundreds of men were hung hundreds of years ago that were accused of various offenses, including robbing banks, horse thievery, murder. So locals will tell you that their spirits still reside here today. Leona's Adobe is said to be one of the most haunted places in Los Angeles County. Ask a local and they'll tell you that the house is haunted by the original owner, Miguel Leonis, who died tragically in a wagon accident. We're here at the sixth restaurant in Calabasas, California, asking visitors how they feel about ghosts. Do you believe in ghosts? I do believe in ghosts. It's why I'm terrified to watch any kind of exorcism, any scary movie. I absolutely believe in that kind of energy. Yes and no. Yes. Yes. I do actually, yes. Tell me why. Well, I have seen them, so as embarrassing it is to talk about, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I've seen them. Do you believe in ghosts? I do. I used to watch a lot of TV shows with my mom. Um, it was called Paranormal Activity, not the actual movie, but the TV show. And I totally believe it. I think there is a new life after death, and it's crazy. I've never actually experienced it, but... I want to. Would you be scared if you saw a ghost? I totally would be scared, but after I like survived it all, I'd totally be about it. <laughs> I would totally be about it. Right now I'm like, yeah, let's go hunt some ghosts. <laughs> when I first started working here, I had a manager that was teaching me how to, cl I'd be closing up every Monday, and he'd tell me about how when he was closing up, he believed that there was a ghost that haunted this place. And I can't even explain to you, I wish the cameras could have on my first night closing here, could have seen me like running from <laughs> locking the front door towards I have to come out here, just sprinting, trying, hoping that I wasn't gonna see anything. <laughs> now I'm headed on location to interview the world famous medium, James Von Prague. James is the author of 10 New York Times bestselling books, the producer of one of the most watched miniseries in CBS history, Living with the Dead with Ted Danson. The Dead Will Tell, starring Eva Longoria, and the creator and executive producer of the hugely successful television series, Ghost Whisperer, starring Jennifer Love Hewitt.
Okay, hi James. <laughs> hi Kelsey, nice to meet you. So I have a few questions for you. Okay. First and foremost, have you ever had an actual encounter with a ghost yourself? Yes, 35 years worth of ghost experiences. Yes, I've been a spiritual medium for 35 years and in that time, well it depends on what you define as a ghost. So that's a little different than we would call maybe a spirit. So to define it, a ghost for me would be, um, hmm, I think when people pass out of the physical world, sometimes there's a residue left behind, an emotional residue. And that part left behind is what people refer to as ghosts. We've talked a lot about consciousness and the meaning of it in this documentary. So let me ask you, what is consciousness in your opinion? Well, to me, consciousness is just being aware. I believe that we are souls and souls are not just contained in this shell. I believe at least 80% of who we are and awareness and energy, uh, if you will, is outside the body. And we are living in several different levels all at once. So consciousness can't exist without the presence of a physical body. Oh, consciousness does exist with that physical body. We have in our world here, we have television, we have computers, we have radios, cell phones, we all have that. <laughs> so, but if we have cell phones, let's just say cell phones. So if we have these cell phones and we're speaking to a credit card company, let's say, <laughs> <laughs> and, ah, ah, give and, me away. which is everybody has to go through that. <sighs> and there is these voices, you know, we're speaking into this machine, this device. What happens? The, the person on the other end of that he hears that, but I don't see the person's voice in the air or the other person. So why, that mean it doesn't exist? So it's on a different level of awareness. It's on another level of life. Um, the same thing as oxygen. Oxygen is all around us. We're living life, we're sustained in our life because of oxygen, yet we don't see oxygen. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So there are many things we don't see in the human spectrum. It's outside of the human spectrum. Right, that's where things get exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very exciting. In your experience as a medium, the people who do come and speak to you that are in the next realm, in the afterlife, what are they seeking to find? Do you have a common denominator that you find a lot of times? Tell me about that. When the spirit people come through, it really gives them an opportunity to come back to a living person and have a last chance to say something to them. So. For instance, let's say there was a father that passed over and he never told his daughter he loved her. Never did that. He just lived his own life, wasn't really outgoing with his feelings, emotions, and he never told her that. Every single person survives human death. There is no such thing as death. You're in the body once and then you're out. And the soul is the mind. The mind is the soul. It's the same thing. The brain dies a physical death, but the mind continues on. And the mind, which is a soul, encapsulates all memories, experiences that we had in this lifetime and other lifetimes, but most recently this current lifetime. So when we go back home to spiritual dimensions, we have what's called a life review. And we relive all the experiences, all the situations, all the interactions we had with other humans, whether it's family, friends, workers, just think then how each person can then be responsible for their thoughts, words, and deeds. If you know that when you pass over, all the people you wronged in your life will be the first ones to greet you on the other side, that'll shake you up and say, wait a minute, I better be very careful how I think, what I say, and what I do. In recent history, many ideas regarding life after death and the existence of what we refer to as ghosts have been silenced or ridiculed as unscientific, as being something outside the realm of reality. However, now physicists are beginning to see a parallel in the law of physics and the laws of the human spiritual dimension as being the same. More and more, science is beginning to detect dimensions and energy it never knew existed. During life after death experiences, people almost always describe the feeling as being filled with extremely positive emotions. The feelings that I felt, I, I had this feeling in my heart of just almost a vibration of pure life, just feeling all at, at one with everything and at peace with everything and just this being alive, this feeling of being alive. and. I realized that I was at one with everything at that moment and I was exactly where I needed to be. I think 
that we're living in a wonderful time. Electronic voice phenomena is being pursued and studied, and they are having certain results in the field of the paranormal. However, we can go back to the time of Thomas Edison, one of the greatest inventors of all time, and he, I think it was in the 1920s, was working on a machine in order to communicate with the so-called dead. And so Edison started that, and I do believe it shall continue. Today, we have a field called electronic voice phenomena, where many times interesting phenomena manifest through recordings and even on certain videos. And so I think the future of the paranormal or ghost visitation could possibly be electronic. The first video is from the Wingate Hotel. The following footage was recorded on September 14, 2003 at the Wingate Hotel in Illinois. The images were captured by the hotel's security cameras. The images have not been edited. After numerous reports of loud noises coming from room 209, hotel security went up to check on who or what might be causing all the racket. There were screams and loud banging reported coming from the room. You can see the security officer in the video, as well as hear the hotel manager on the radio in the background. Once the security officer enters the room, he finds that a lot of strange things have taken place. Also, if you look closely, you'll see a ghostly image exiting the room seconds after he opens the door. In this next video, we'll see a recording from a security camera in a building in Malaysia recorded during the making of a documentary film exploring why a number of people have disappeared in the building. In one room, we see a chair moving and a door shutting by itself with no one in the room. In a second security camera, we see a woman sitting alone. Moments later, a chair, a good distance behind her, moves out on its own. The woman looks back to see what is happening and sees no one. Then a few seconds later, a chair directly in front of her moves to one side. The woman runs to the side of the room in fear. For a moment, she looks around in confusion, but then lunges for the front door to escape just as the entity moves several objects, blocking her exit. Hitting her head on the moving table, she falls to the floor and soon appears to lose consciousness. The Whitstable Nutrition Center Ghost This security camera footage shows a customer shopping for various health products while behind him, on screen right, we see an orange box of tea bags move out from the shelf and suspend itself in midair. Another item, to screen left, suddenly flies off the shelf, and while the man leans down to pick it up, he's still unaware of the floating box of tea just inches away, which then suddenly falls to the floor. The man then turns and picks up the fallen box of tea, assuming it had just fallen, rather than having been hovering over his head for the past several moments. The shopkeeper admits to being baffled by the footage, but she still holds a skeptical view of paranormal activity being the cause. However, she still doesn't know what triggered the strange manifestation seen in her shop security camera footage. Office Boy Ghost Two office boys are in a back room taking a nap after a long day's work in India when suddenly a ghost intercedes.
Ghosts are by definition out-of-body experiences that occur after death. Without a combination of both of these manifestations, ghosts would not be possible in the form we understand them to be. Following up on these after-death, out-of-body experiences, Peg Abernathy recounts her encounter with these experiences before and after her physical life had ended. I was a lead singer in a band in Los Angeles, California, and one night we were performing, and uh, I wasn't feeling very good the whole night, but I went on anyway, but it was getting worse and worse, and it was time to take a break, so I turned around and pointed to all the guys in the band and introduced everybody in the band to the audience when all of a sudden I felt tremendous pain that was radiating all throughout my midsection and it was getting worse and worse and worse and I just looked at the guys and I said stop you know we got to go home I got to go home they got me off the stage and they loaded up all the equipment and we headed out down the freeway my husband was the drummer in the band and I just kept screaming in the car, and finally I said, hospital, hospital, like that. I, I, that's all I could say. I really couldn't talk more than that. And uh, we ended up at the ER. I began to realize that I was really, really in trouble. I didn't understand what was going on. All I knew is that I was in extreme pain and I needed help. And I remember I began to float over beautiful treetops there were other beings and my grandmother was there uh, egging me on and encouraging me on and I remember that and as I was going over the treetops I found myself going towards a tunnel with a light at the end of the tunnel and I went into the tunnel and I remember thinking this must be what it's like when you're born because as I was coming out of the tunnel I burst into this beautiful light and my senses were inundated with love and peace and just the most amazing sensation. You really can't describe it in, in human terms at all. Um, you have to just describe it as a feeling and something that you can only experience and not really say in a word. At that point, as I was floating in this beautiful, loving white light, I began to see my life play out before me. My birth, my childhood, uh, my young adulthood, my marriage. Based on my personal experience in my working with patients, I have no doubt that we pre-exist this physical body and we post-exist this physical body. Since the dawn of mankind, there has been an acceptance of the existence of an afterlife, as well as the manifestation of ghosts. In fact, virtually all of the world's major religions are based on it. The phrase, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is just one example of this as it appears in all Christian denominations around the world. You know, in our church we do certainly embrace uh, the fact that people can communicate with the spirit world and I'm, I'm always amazed that some people are a little afraid of that. Uh, certainly there are quite a number of religions uh, that don't embrace that. But doesn't it make sense that if we all believe that life is continuous, uh, that at some point uh, somebody in the spirit world would like to pass on uh, information to us, uh, especially those that we love, uh, because we know that love never dies. Mediumship in and of itself is allowing communication between those who have passed on and those who are still with us here. Um, this all happens on the level of energy, and by that I mean that everything around us is energy, from our physical bodies to the clothes we wear, the vehicles we drive, uh, to the floor I'm standing on. It's all made of the same energy. The only difference is the way molecules are arranged and the way that energy is vibrating. After Sonny Bono passed away, uh, Cher came to me and heard about me through her mom, good friends with her mom. And she didn't really know anything about mediumship or, or talk to the spirit, but she, she really wanted to talk to Sunny. So, funny enough, I went to her place where she lives, and uh, she met me at the door and um, went to a room upstairs. First, her family members came through, and their Armenian names came through. And Sunny finally came through, probably the fourth or fifth or sixth person, came through very clearly and told her that she was in the closet the night before holding a pair of earrings that he gave her when they first met. And she said, yes, that's exactly right. And then I, he came through and said, the phone, I've been playing around with you with the phone. And she goes, that's just so weird because my phone has been acting very, very strange the past couple of weeks. That's just weird. 
I said, well, he's also going to help you. He said he wants to help you make a hit. There's going to be an album coming out. It's going to do really, really well. It's going to be a big hit, and it's him influencing it to happen. And it's going to be, he said, you have to believe it. You have to believe it. He believes it. I believe it. About seven, eight months later, a year later, she came out with the album, Big Big Hit, I Believe, the Believe album. And we've been friends ever since, and her mother and I have good friends. And just today, as we're filming this for this, this movie, this documentary, in the mail, I received a card. That's from George's mother. And inside is a picture of Cher and her mother, Georgia. Next, I'm going to visit one of LA's best known psychics, Eddie Connor, to get a psychic reading about my life and future. And you're supposed to be having a ring on your finger not terribly long from now. Does that make you nervous? It does. Really? Yeah, it's going to come out of nowhere. Have you been proposed to already? Yes. Once or twice? Once. Okay, you got two more proposals coming up to you. And sometimes, wait, is it you that breaks out into almost like accents you can be totally just hanging out and then all of a sudden you're like woo, 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 and you just fall off into an accent somewhere for fun i do okay yes. were you were you one of those kids that would sing off key and stuff and just love just love doing it but then you sort of tone down when you were a kid yeah okay you're gonna think i've lost my mind but they're saying that believe it or not Sometimes when you're projecting in your own camera and you're doing stuff, there's a little inner child energy around your digestive system, your solar plexus, that will sort of will sort of say, don't project too loud, don't do this too much, because the authorities, which were then teachers, are trying to get you to tone it down. And with you, the whole pattern in your life is when it rains, it pours. Have you not noticed yeah, that? Yeah, all the time, yeah. Feast or famine, rain, or when it rains, it pours. Now you're getting ready to go into a when it rains, it pours experience, just oh, so you know. Glory in the highest. Many people say they can't believe in life after life or ghost because they can't believe things they can't see. They should carefully reconsider this perspective in light of the fact that many of the things we take for granted from day to day are invisible. As we know, gravity is invisible and time is invisible. We can't see the voices traveling to our cell phones, which send our voices from a tiny little box that can travel thousands of miles through the sky, bounce off a satellite in space, and miraculously reach one specific cell phone amongst millions of cell phones somewhere on Earth. Other day-to-day -day invisible phenomena are the images and sounds consisting of billions of scrambled bits of information, which are being beamed into the sky and somehow reassembling themselves faultlessly into our TV sets. In fact, these concepts seem absurd and we can't see the energy that makes them work, but we know and accept that they happen. discoveries of, of the new physics over the last century have actually confirmed the underlying fundamental spiritualism or idealism of the traditional religions of the world. Uh, and that if we continue along this line, I think we're already experiencing it. There will be a renaissance of spiritualities, hopefully not in fundamentalistic forms. Human beings require the spiritual perspective. Why? Because we're deluded? No, because fundamentally we are consciousness and we require a science that's capable not of blotting that out, but of understanding that as being as fundamental to human experience as, as physicality is. Uh, what is consciousness? For uh, a big mouth like me, it's, it's not to act like a dumbass. And I know that sounds odd, but there are times that I say something and I must have been unconscious when I said it. Because after I hear myself say it or someone says, do you know what you just said? and I'm embarrassed and everything else, it's almost like, a, you know, those drunks that have blackouts? I say some completely stupid thing. And I'm totally conscious, but then I don't remember the stupid thing. So for me, consciousness is, is total awareness of, of being awake, like I am now. 
The other thing about consciousness is we seem really good looking to ourselves while we're conscious. And then you look in the mirror, <laughs> oh God. But like right now, I feel like, you know, I'm super handsome and you know, all of that stuff. So what's fun about consciousness, it's really good if you don't look in the mirror. <laughs> consciousness is what ghosts are. They are the disembodied existence of the mind. Consciousness is what allows us to be aware of our existence. It is what allows us to think and create. However, how many people stop and think about what consciousness actually is? So what is consciousness? So when people talk about consciousness, what do they mean by that? Let's keep it simple because we can really go complex into this. So to me, consciousness is awareness. It's awareness of where you are right now. So right now in time and place. So if you're sitting here and you're watching this, hopefully you're in this space, in this present moment. But the consciousness also, you can go in the past. You can remember something from your childhood. So your consciousness can be brought back to that time and place, a memory, an experience, an event. So you can also go to the future and you can use your consciousness, your mind thoughts to the future of where you would like to see yourself, visualize yourself. So that's real too. Just because you haven't experienced it yet physically does not mean it's not real. Dr. Warner von Braun, German rocket physicist and astronautics engineer, who is generally regarded as the father of the American space program, had this to say about the relationship between science and life after life. Everything science has taught me and continues to teach me strengthens my belief in the continuity of our spiritual existence after death. Colin Wilson, a prolific English philosopher and writer, points out that the sheer volume for survival after death is so immense that to ignore it is like standing at the foot of Mount Everest and insisting that you cannot see the mountain. The question of where does consciousness come in a material universe is sometimes called the really hard question. And you know, if you start from a materialistic perspective, it is a really hard question. Where does consciousness come from? How do you get consciousness out of, out of matter, out of, out of you know, colliding particles? But I would say, looking back to the great idealistic philosophies of India and of Europe, to the German idealists, to the British idealists, is that if you start from, the, from consciousness, it's no longer a really hard problem. It becomes the really easy problem. It's much easier to explain matter from the standpoint of consciousness than it is to explain consciousness from the standpoint of matter. Quantum theory is the theory that describes the interactions of all semiatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons, and quarks. However, quantum theory has been unable to provide an explanation for all the manifestations of our universe and how these manifestations interact with Einstein's theory of relativity. In fact, in many ways, the theory of relativity and the quantum theory are mutually exclusive, especially when it comes to the concept of gravity. One of the interesting questions we face is if E equals mc squared, then according to this calculation, all things have mass as part of their physical equation, although light, which consists of photons, has no mass, yet it definitely has energy. Could this energy be the missing link to connect all the known laws of our universe? To fix this paradox, a new mathematical model of theoretical physics called string theory emerged. String theory demonstrated how all particles, in fact, all forms of energy, could be constructed of strings of energy in a universe that is made up of as many as 11 dimensions. We are all familiar with the three primary dimensions of height, width, and length. And we are becoming more and more familiar with the fourth dimension of time, which gives us a total of four dimensions in our known world. We can see three of the dimensions, height, width, and length, and can observe the fourth dimension of time. The other seven dimensions believed to exist in string theory are not visible, just as time and gravity are not visible. Although in the not too distant future, it is projected that we will be able to observe these dimensions, just as we have been able to observe the subatomic particles we never knew existed until late into the 20th century. With all this in mind, what is our material world made of, and how does the human soul manifest itself in this world or in any other dimension? Well, based on modern physics, it's actually energy field producing the body. 
the body uh, is associated with the energy field, and the evidence is, as indicated, the energy field is producing the body. In other words, as the physicists would view it, all substance is a manifestation of interacting energy field producing the experience of substance. The nature of death is, of course, the soul leaving the human body. I think the soul creates the human body by energetically putting energy around the physical part that's being created in the mother's womb. And the soul leaves when the body is finished with its particular reason, if you will, for being alive. But the soul never dies. The soul is eternal. And it may hang around the death scene for a while, especially if there's a lot of trauma or grief going on. But otherwise, the soul moves on to examine the lessons from that life learned or not learned, and then to move on to study and prepare for the next lesson and the next life. A highly relevant study into the understanding of consciousness was done by a flight surgeon in the U.S. Navy who was attempting to understand how and at what level the human brain was able to withstand the enormous gravitational forces exerted on it during flight in a fighter jet. In order to observe the actual phenomenon take place, the surgeon placed fighter pilots in a large centrifuge and spun them around at tremendous speeds until the blood in their brains stopped flowing. What he found was entirely unexpected, as after the fighter pilots technically lapsed into a coma, this is when the pilots returned to full consciousness and awareness, after they had lost all the physiological functions in their brains. The surgeon's findings are clearly contradictory to all current knowledge of neurological science. Well, what we are is we're fundamentally consciousness, we're fundamentally awareness. And so the idea that we're bodies is, uh, is a, as an illusion that we have to overcome. Oh yeah, well, the physical body is just a, a little machine, like a tank that we drive around in. Uh, the, the soul is truly, well, I think of the soul as the puppeteer. As long as we pay attention to our ideals, then we're working in concert with the puppeteer or the soul. The minute we decide to do something that is not part of our ideals for whatever reason, then it's like Pinocchio getting cut off from his puppet master. The question of the relationship between the mind or soul and the physical body is one of the most ancient problems of philosophy, probably first discussed by Pythagoras. And in short, there are maybe a dozen or so major theories of how our unique experience of consciousness is related to that, uh, to the physical body. And Descartes' uh, dualism, that there are two separate things that interact, is one idea, but then there's various kinds of monism as well which says there is only one thing, either a mind or a body. And uh, idealists say, for example, that the bodily part of us is sort of an illusion and that what we essentially are is our minds and our thoughts. Materialists, on the other hand, say that the primary reality is the physical substance of the body and what we experience as uh, consciousness is an epiphenomenon or a, an unreal byproduct. Throughout history, man has believed in life after death, and virtually all major religions today still believe this to be true. However, curiously, throughout the ages there have also been a number of prohibitions to believing such a phenomenon exists. What's behind these objections, and what were and are they founded on? One problem in the West in particular uh, in, in Western Europe and the societies that descend from them is that for a long time, one religious institution controlled all intellectual discourse and uh, it controlled what one could believe. And if one believed something contrary to what was held to be the truth, the consequences could be dire. And so for a good thousand years in Western Europe, particularly in the Latin speaking Western part of the empire, it was one truth, one religion, one way. And this, this put a, a, this dampened, this completely shut down the intellectual life of, 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 of Western Europe. And it took a number of centuries and the work of 
many courageous people who lost a lot, sometimes their lives, to overcome this religious tyranny. And as a consequence of that, that created a kind of path, that was that it created an illness, a disease, an anti-religious animus on the part of intellectuals in the West who were determined never again to surrender their intellectual freedom to a religious organization. And if that meant a fundamental rejection of the spiritual and an embrace of materialism, then that seems to be what has happened. Up until two years ago, scientists believed it was impossible to obtain invisibility. But today, we know that isn't true. It was taught all through the 20th and up until the 21st century that it was impossible for light to bend around an object and reform at the other end, which is the essence of what is needed to obtain invisibility. But every physics professor and every physics textbook on the planet Earth was wrong. At Duke University, the foundations for creating invisibility were accomplished by demonstrating that it was possible to have microwave radiation bend around an object and reform at the other end, as if the object was not there. Then at Caltech, just a year and a half later, the same test was successfully done with visible light. Now, just think about that. We can now take an object and make it disappear, just like in the movies. We have to remember that when the physical body dies, the brain goes with it. However, the mind continues with the soul. The mind is not limited to the physical body. It is eternal. The modern day string theory teaches us that there are strings that vibrate at different harmonic frequencies, and the harmony of these strings creates all the other matter and energy in the universe the sun, the planets, and the stars. Generally, string theory is a theory that explains all the laws of our physical universe, which likely includes the physical laws of what we have through the millennium referred to as the life and the hereafter. Stephen Hawking famously said that such a theory would be the ultimate triumph of human reason, for then we should know the mind of God. As the string theory presents itself in a total of 11 different dimensions of existence, this new theory of physics may be able to fully explain what causes the manifestation of what we call ghosts. Science is just beginning to understand that the spirit itself is also a form of energy, and that the only difference between the physical energy that creates the spirit and the physical energy that creates our physical bodies is the state that the energy is in at the time. We cannot see the energy that produces spirit, just as we can't see the energy that produces time, although both are eternal. As our intellect continues on through time, we will continue to evolve as we come closer and closer to the greatest power of all, the power of thought and creativity. As Nikola Tesla, one of the greatest scientists of all time, once said, the gift of mental power comes from God, divine being. And if we concentrate our minds on that truth, we become in tune with this great power. I have begun to believe that we are not primarily our physical bodies. That means none of this is what we think it is. It means that the evidence of the five senses tells us about a world that is true up to a point, but there must be something more going on behind all of this. Next, we will investigate the military's secret Stargate program, which investigated the existence of consciousness beyond the physical mind and its ability to travel through space and time by a process known as remote viewing. This study demonstrates how consciousness can extend itself beyond the physical body, which is exactly what a ghost is believed to be, the extension of consciousness beyond the physical brain. For more information on this project, we were able to speak directly to the program's operations officer, Captain Skip Atwater. Now, it's not actually seeing. I know it carries the name remote viewing. It's not actually seeing with these eyes, but people tend to describe things as though they could see them. Much like um, when you have a dream at night, you obviously weren't using these eyes during your dream, but you can certainly describe 
what you saw in your dream. So it's that same kind of a mental aptitude to be able to describe things that you're directed to describe by mental means alone. There was a concept of if our enemies are using this thing called remote viewing against us, how can we assess the quality, reliability, intelligence value of the material they were collecting? I would go into a room with a sealed envelope, in this case it had a satellite picture of this building in it, and I would say to the remote viewer, in this envelope is a picture of our target today. Describe the picture to me. And um, the initial remote viewing came back is, this is a very cold area, it seems like an industrial area of some kind. And the Colonel then, Colonel Webb said, that is correct, this is in a cold area and it is an industrial area. Now I want you to describe building number 4927. He began to describe construction, uh, flashing lights like welding, a smelling of uh, what it's like to weld metal together. Next day go back in and we start talking about this very, very large tubular device that seems to be welded and it seems to evolve into the description of a submarine. The remote viewer began to describe very interesting aspects to this submarine, that it was larger than any submarine he'd ever seen before, larger than any concept, that it had a very flat tail, and that it had missile tubes that were angled instead of, the missile tubes in the front didn't go just straight up and down, they went on an angle. And that means that the submarine can fire its missiles while it's traveling. It doesn't have to stop to launch these missiles. So that was an extremely important piece of intelligence information. They then asked us to see whether or not we could predict when it would be completed and when it would be launched. So I went back in with a remote viewer and we worked on a, a timeline. I had him draw on his paper a ruler and told him that as he marched along the ruler, it represented months in the future. And I asked him to move his pencil along the ruler until he perceived the submarine being launched. And he moved his submarine to January 3rd of the following year. And it turns out that the submarine was actually launched. They came in with bulldozers and dug out a big trench to the ocean. And the submarine was actually launched on January 6th. So he missed it by three days. But we did have a satellite overhead that was able to photograph it actually tied up at the dock. On the subject of communicating through another dimension and on different frequencies, it's sometimes interesting to think about where voices come from that are heard by perfectly sane people that appear out of nowhere with no identifiable source. Ralph Johnson is one of those people, a World War II veteran who experienced a voice from what he believes was from the highest dimension during his tour of duty overseas. Mostly I want to speak to you about my experiences in life that led up to what the main story is that I'm going to tell you. Uh, it goes back to World War II. I was a soldier in an amphibious attack unit, 812th Amphibious Force. We worked and fought against the Japanese over there, who were the most ferocious fighters you ever want to meet. I was on patrol by myself, uh, going somewhere at the time. I have to mention to you that my sense of direction is terrible on, on land. And so I wind up going up the side of a cliff on a one-way roadway that just barely accommodated the amphibious craft that I was driving. And it went up and there was no turning around at this point. I had to go until we reached a plateau. I would say about 100, 150 feet off the ground where I started at. And I wound up on a, a plateau and just barely making it on there with this craft, the craft weighs uh, alone 19,000 pounds. So it's a little cumbersome in a sense, about uh, maybe 100, 150 
yards away, I saw a little po sign post, and I pulled the duck up, uh, and I got down on the driver's side uh, to see. I was happy. I said, well, the sign, I know it most likely tell me something uh, that uh, will be helpful to me. So I got down, walked around the front of the duck, and I, <laughs> you can <laughs> hardly believe what the sign said. It said, minefield, caution. So I had come through the minefield, 19,000 pound craft myself, and I don't know now whether I had some cargo, uh, through a minefield. <laughs> so uh, when I got <laughs> my heart back, <laughs> I decided, okay, I'm going to reconnoiter. But when I re reconnoiter, I have a 45 automatic on my side. I have a rifle on my shoulder and a hand grenade or two to make sure things uh, will go my way if I encounter anything. So I'm walking and uh, I bump into a dead Japanese soldier in front of me. And the blood coming out of his chest, there was steam coming out with it. So I realized that he hadn't been dead long. And uh, the further I walked into this, the worse it got, the more soldiers I saw. And they were all dead, some with, some with their swords and all, which was a sort of a style of a Japanese warrior in full dress. And I didn't know whether they had turned back or what, but I didn't, couldn't leave my craft there. I didn't know what to do. And I said, oh my God, all of these dead soldiers. And the further I went, the more fearful I became. It was so bad that I could, I could hardly speak. And I was shaken and nervous because there was hundreds of them. And I hollered out, oh God, all of these dead men. A voice came from the heavens and said to me, there is no death. They are not dead. There is no death. Philip L. Berman, a Harvard theologian and author of the Pulitzer Prize nominated The Search for Meaning, had this to say, To date, I have not met, heard, or read about a single person who has had a near-death experience, who has not come away from his or her experience, convinced that God or some form of ultimate transcendent reality exists. If there is one thing that near-death experiences are adamant about, it is this, that death is not an end.